My, my, my. Y'all trying to have a little church up in here. Without the R, church. If you have your Bibles, please meet me in 1 Peter chapter 2. And we are making our way through the book of 1 Peter. If you're new with us here, when I got into a conversation, dialogued with the elders, um, and we were talking about the potential of our family moving here from New York City to serve you all, uh, I let it be known that uh, my conviction um, is I subscribe to a style of teaching uh, called expository preaching. And the exact, amen. Some of y'all get that. Others of us, I just spoke in tongues or a foreign language. What expository preaching simply means is uh, making our way through books of the Bible, letting the word of God speak for itself. Because God said at the end of the day, my word will not return void. And so you all need a steady diet, not of my thoughts, but of God's word. All right. So here's what that means. Here's what that means. You, 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 pick, a, you pick a book, you go, I'm gonna, we're going to work through it from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through the end. And sometimes what that means is um, you'll preach stuff that you love to talk about, all right? Um, and then sometimes it means you'll preach stuff uh, that you don't really want to talk about, sort of like growing up in my mama's house. I remember I was a big time sophomore at the age of 19 and came home on a break from school and mama decided to do something she hadn't done in a while. She actually cooked and she laid it out. And um, I love mama's cooking, but I just didn't like her greens. I like greens, but mama, she just couldn't get them quite right. Um, so when the chicken came, I put some on my plate. When the macaroni and cheese came, I put some, I got to stop talking like this. Um, um, but when the greens came, I just let it pass. And, and mama, my mama's from Philly. She, uh, she said, I don't recall taking your order. <laughs> and she proceeded to put more greens on my plate than if I'd have gone ahead and put the greens on my plate myself. You know, to be a preacher... Committed to preaching the word of God, the whole counsel of God means that at the end of the day, I don't take y'all's order. I give you the word of God. And sometimes we get to some passages of scripture, man, and it's the good stuff, like the stuff that we like. It's all good, but it's stuff that we like. It's red velvet cake and German chocolate cake and stuff that's going to be in heaven. But now there's some sections of scripture that we get to and we go, uh, it's kind of like mama's greens. It may not be good to you, but it's good for you. Let's have some of mama's greens this morning. Pick me up in first Peter chapter two, before I tell you the verse, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I planned this out six months ago. You're going to think, you're going to think that, that I'm trying to set an agenda. I'm not. I planned this out six months ago. Pick me up in verse 13. Be subject, 1 Peter 2, 13, for the Lord's sake to every institution, whether it be to the emperor, or we could say president, as supreme, or to governors. Actually, that word could be translated as police officers. Yeah, I knew y'all, yeah, it's going to be quiet. It's going to be quiet. I get it. As sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this, verse 15, is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Finally, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and he just says it one more time, honor the emperor. So I want to talk about what God's word says about the Christian's relationship with government. 
And I want to preach on the subject being November 9th, 2016. November 8th, we'll know who the next president is. And I want to talk about what happens the next day. What does God expect from you and I as Christians living under the Donald or Hillary Clinton? Yes, it's quiet in here. It's, 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 it's quiet. It's quiet. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, let your seed, let the seed of your word fall on good ground. And may it bear much fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. A man went over an elderly woman's house one evening for a meeting. Sat down with her in her living room. And he noticed on her coffee table was a little dish filled with peanuts. He asked this elderly woman, do you mind if I eat some of your peanuts? She says, oh no, go ahead, eat as much as you like. They start conversing and talking, and he starts popping peanuts into his mouth. Lo and behold, about halfway through the conversation, he realizes that the dish of peanuts is now almost empty. He's embarrassed. He says, ma'am, please forgive me, he says to this elderly lady. I, my mama taught me better than that. Here I am talking to you, and I've, I've almost run through your whole dish of peanuts. Please forgive me. It's rude. The elderly lady said, oh, that's no problem, sir. See, recently I had all my teeth removed and I sucked the chocolate off of them and put the peanuts <laughs> back in the dish. <laughs> the moral of the story is looks can be deceiving. My grandmama used to say, not everybody talking about heaven is going. How do I really know I'm a Christian? How do I really know I'm saved? I can tell you when I said the prayer, I said the prayer at the age of four because I went to vacation Bible school, four years old. It's probably the best thing to do, to do. They showed a class of four-year-olds a film on hell, and I came home and said to my mom and dad, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> but Lord have mercy if the only thing I can rest my salvation on is a prayer that I prayed, then I'm in trouble. How do I really know that I'm show sure enough saved? How do I really know I'm a Christian? In a lot of ways, we've been investigating this question as we've just matriculated our way through the book of 1 Peter. We've discovered that, that if there's one word that sums up the whole book of 1 Peter, it's the word exile. And we've learned over and over again that the idea of the word exile in the original language Peter is writing in Greek it is a word that simply means the close stranger. It is someone who's geographically close, and yet you realize that even though they live in geographical proximity of you, everything about them tells you that they're not from here. They live here, but they're not from here. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus, that there's just this overwhelming sense that even though I might live next door to you, even though I might work in the cubicle next to you, at the same office as you, there's just something different about my life. In fact, one week we actually said, kind of tongue-in-cheek, that exile is actually spelled D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, to be a Christian fundamentally means I'm different. Not that I act like I'm better than, not that I'm act, acting like I'm some kind of, um, on some kind of a high horse. I'm not arrogant. I'm humble. But there's just an aroma that emanates from my life that says I'm different. Therefore, to be a Christian is to be an exile. To be an exile is to be different. And yet to be different is to leave a difference. That God has called me to leave a difference wherever I am. 
And if ever there was a word that needed to be heard by Christians who are living in one of the most desirable places in the world, the bay, we need to understand this ain't home. Enjoy it, love it, appreciate it, have a good time in it, relax, it's wonderful. But there's going to come a moment when God's going to say, give me back my breath, and you ain't taking none of the stuff with you. So God has called you to something bigger than a zip code to something bigger than the kind of car that you drive. There's a bigger narrative that he's pulling you into. He's called us to make a difference. Now, this can be a little sketchy because the idea here is he saved us. He's left us here. He's called us to be a part of a group of exiles in this thing called the church, But the church doesn't function as an entity of itself. I don't function as an entity unto myself. I live under the very real reality and rule of a government. And the government colors aspects of my life. So I can't talk about how to be an exile who makes a difference in this world, who lives different, without at some point touching on What does it look like for me as a follower of Jesus Christ to be a good citizen that lives in relationship to government? What does that look like? It's a very, very sketchy issue. Now, if ever this was an issue that needed to be talked about, it especially needed to be talked about in Peter's day. Because in Peter's day, their governmental leader was crazy. Or as the young folks say, he was cray-cray. This guy's name who's leading the Roman Empire, who these Christians are living under the Roman Empire's rule, the emperor, most scholars tell us, who is leading the Roman Empire, his name is Nero. If you studied world history, you got to know Nero. Again, Nero was cray-cray. He killed his own mother. He poisoned his aunt with a laxative. He got furious with one of his wives, who happened to be pregnant, And he kicked her so violently and so often and so repetitively, it not only killed the baby inside of her, it killed her. He fell in love with a little boy, had him castrated, married him, and lived openly as husband and wife. He burned the city of Rome to the ground. And as it burned, he sang an opera. This guy was crazy. And what does Peter say in our text? Honor the emperor. Be subject to him. Now, if ever there was kind of a parallel, and again, I planned this out six months in advance. You and I live in some politically cray-cray times. A New York Times article recently revealed what we already know. This article says that about half of all voters hold unfavorable views of both candidates. It would go on to say, six in ten Republicans, Democrats, and Independents all say they are not looking forward to the coming weeks of this election. So just just show of hands, show of hands, if you feel comfortable, who here is excited about this election? Yeah, a few few, okay? So I think the pervading feeling among most, not everybody, among most, is this ain't exciting times. For some, it's the antithesis of excitement. It's despair. One of the ways I know that it's, uh, it's not exciting times, it's my first time living in the Bay. I don't know how y'all roll in the Bay. I'm still getting to know y'all in the Bay. But everywhere else I've lived and owned houses, during election time, you can drive down the street and all these houses on the neighborhoods, they got little signs in the neighborhood with the president's name on it, vote for Obama, vote for McCain. I ain't seen not one sign in my neighborhood. My grandma and them used to say, not nary a sign. I ain't seen no Hillary sign. I ain't seen no Trump sign. I ain't ain't seen on my neighborhood. I ain't seen on the street in front of me, the street behind me. I ain't seen in the Silicon Valley. I mean, just we just, I I don't see too many bumper stickers. I don't see too many buttons. I don't see too many T-shirts. Just doesn't seem to be this pervasive feeling of excitement. 
So what are we to do? If this New York Times article is right, and I've got to tread carefully here. I'm not here to promote a candidate. I'm not here to come against a candidate, put all my cards on the table. You just got to know me. My kids talked about it yesterday. I, I, I hate partisan politics. It's just me. I just hate mindlessly voting for a candidate just because they're part of a party. I, 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 I'm, I'm an independent. I'm a registered independent. I want to seek God. God, I, I want to be a part of it. I vote. I just plan on being a part of that. But my goodness, what does this mean for us as Christians? What does God have to say to us? What are meta-narrative, big picture, governing principles that are, to, that are to dominate how I talk about the next president, how I write about the next president on a Facebook post? What does God expect from me as a Christian, if I were to just give you a statement that canvases our text, 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17, a little tweetable statement that's, that gets at the heartbeat, here's the big picture point. Here's the central theme of our text. Peter wants us to understand that our Christian witness is strengthened when we are good citizens. Our Christian witness is strengthened when we are good citizens. Now here's the question I want to dominate the rest of our time together. What does it mean to be a good citizen? Verse 13. He says, be subject. Be subject. This is a command. It's what we would call Peter's writing in Greek. In Greek construction is called an imperative. It is a command. P Peter is not suggesting. He's not just giving advice. He is giving us a command. He says, I am commanding you, commanding you, commanding you, be subject. To be subject simply means to live under, to submit in both action and attitude. This word does not just speak of my actions, it also speaks of my attitude. Paul uses this word in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, when he says to fellow believers in the church, be subject to one another. Then, he then says, I want wives to submit to their husbands. Same word. Over and over again, he says, to be a Christian means we are to be subject. Now, let me just give you some scripture here as it relates to this idea of submission and government. Titus 3.1 says this. Paul says, look at it with me on the screen. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Now, please know, he, 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 he doesn't mention names. I'm going to get to this in a minute. He mentions positions. Be subject, be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. But why, pastor, should I submit and be subject to Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump? The answer to this is found in Romans 13. Look at it with me on the screen. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. Uh, y'all, y'all quiet today. Y'all, this ain't no shouting sermon, but I'm giving you the whole counsel of God. You study the scriptures, there are three institutions God ordains, three. One, first one, is family. Second one, is government. Third one that we're living under today is church. These are his three instruments that he uses to shape the world, to transform the world, and to accomplish his good pleasure and good purposes here on earth. Family. Government, church. Romans 13 tells us government is not man's idea. It is God's invention, and specifically, government is God's instrument. 
What Paul goes on to say in Romans 13 is that every single governmental leader has either been appointed by God or allowed by God. Every leader, every good leader, every bad leader, every leader, there is no such thing in the theater of world history for there have to ever been an election that surprised God. God ain't surprised. He's not popping Maylocks over what's going to happen in the debate tonight. In fact, it is well within the scope of the sovereignty of God to say that God will not only allow one of these leaders, he could very well be appointing. Well, you need Bible. Jeremiah 25, verse 9. Look at it with me on the screen. God says, Behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, hear it, my servant. And I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. Now, wait a minute, I thought Nebuchadnezzar was evil. Ding, 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 you're right. God calls him my servant. Here's what he's saying. My people are wilding out, acting crazy. I'll fix that. Raise up an evil, crazy leader to deal with wild, reckless, crazy people. And he's not going to do not one thing I don't give him permission to do. He's my instrument to accomplish my good aims here on earth. If God can do that with Nebuchadnezzar, again, I want to be careful. I want to be careful. I, I know we're venturing into the realm of politics and government. You, you guys are probably going to send some emails. Uh, my email address is rshell at uh, alcf.net. But here's what I want you to understand. This message is not about who to vote for. But if you think Trump is crazy, if you think Hillary's crazy, God's used crazier. And he calls Nebuchadnezzar a crazy leader, my servant. He works for me. Paul says in Romans 13, therefore, to disrespect a leader, good or bad, is to disrespect God. Are y'all getting this word today? So my pastor is my godfather. I remember years ago working for him, and his son, my godbrother, was about eight at the time. My eight-year-old godbrother decided to walk into his Sunday school class. Just one Sunday morning, I was working at church. Sunday school class run by a Sunday school teacher that his father, my pastor, had appointed. My God brother walks up in the class, eight years old, and says, Servant notice, I don't want to hear nothing about no Jesus today. Don't want to hear nothing about him, and I ain't going to do nothing you say. Well, I think we know what happened when word got back to his dad. Boy got the spanking of his life. Why? Because he had disrespected an authority that the pastor had appointed and to disrespect that authority that that pastor had appointed was to disrespect that pastor. I grew up in a house, and it was just understood. If the teacher sent a note home, called home, I, I, I don't know about your house, but the house I grew up in, it, it seemed like they just automatically took their side. Like they didn't want to hear what I had to say. Am I grew up in a house like that? My parents just, I mean, th this whole notion of innocent until proven guilty, not when it comes to teachers. They just didn't, 
It's just not how they flowed. Why? My parents operated from this idea of to disrespect an authority that we have entrusted, who's really operating under our authority, is to disrespect us. So what are we to do? Here's what he says. He says it twice in our text. How are we to be subject? He says this. He says in verse 17, honor the emperor. I love it. He doesn't say honor Nero. He doesn't say honor Claudius. He doesn't say honor Caesar Augustus. He doesn't mention a name. He mentions the position. His point is honor the position even if you don't like the person. Now, there's a disconnect. Praise God, we live in a democracy. And in a democracy, what that means is we have a voice. We have a vote. So that to be a Christian, I think we can honor and still express a different viewpoint and cast a different vote. Totally permissible, totally allowable, but at no point do we express those differences of opinion in a disrespectful manner. Corey and I have uh, some friends of ours, and uh, we were out to dinner with them some years ago, and uh, at the time they had a little girl who was, in their words, very, very loquacious. She just loved to just talk. And if her problem was, if it got to her brain, there was no filter between her brain and her mouth. She thought it, she said it. So the mama said to her, you know, honey, I'm trying to help you, and I want to teach you honor and respect. So here's what we're going to do. If, some, if I tell you to do something in, 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 or, or, or you, you think you're going to say something that might offend somebody, just cover your mouth. The mama told us a couple weeks later they were out at Target, and the girl was getting into something she shouldn't have been getting into, and, and, and the mama told her not to do something, and the girl said, well, the mama said, well, now I'm curious. What was you, what you cover your mouth for? She said, Mama, I was about to tell you to shut up. The mama said, the girl said, what, what'd you do that for? She said, I was about to spank you and you're behind. You know, when it comes to our governmental leaders, I just got to tell you, some of the most disheartening stuff. I, I, I just have to get off Facebook during political season. The, the nastiness and the venom in which Christians talk about potential leaders is godless. It's silly and it's godless. It's silly because, really, I have never seen a Facebook exchange where a person goes, you know what, you're right. I changed my view. Let's change it. It's not going to happen. It's a waste of time. And it's not honoring to God. Now, this brings up an interesting question. The question on the table is, is there ever a point for we as Christians to disobey government? Answer, yes. Peter hints at this in our text in verse 13 when he says, be subject, underline this phrase, for the Lord's sake. The idea being is, here is that we Christians get a loophole. That is, whenever government asks us to do something that is contradictory to the law of God, we Christians are now expected to practice something called civil disobedience. This is all throughout scripture. Write down Exodus chapter 1. The government, Pharaoh says, I want you Hebrew midwives. When these women are giving birth, if it's a male child, I want you to slaughter the male babies. Hebrew midwives refuse. Why? They are allowing God's law to trump man's law. Daniel chapter 3. We see another instance of civil disobedience. Nebuchadnezzar sets up this image. He says, I am commanding you, when you hear the sound of the music, to bow and worship this image. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, we can't do that. We worship one person, and it ain't you. 
You're his servant. We worship the boss. And the boss is God. To take you to Acts, the Jewish leaders, the Jewish governing authorities say to Peter and John, stop talking about this Jesus guy. And they say in so many words, we can't shut up. We would rather obey God than to obey man. Is there a case for civil disobedience? Absolutely. When man's law contradicts God's law, we always go with God. Why? Because God will always trump Trump. He will always supersede Hillary. He is to where our allegiance should be. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said it this way, of course, if there's ever a moving picture of a Christian man who practiced civil disobedience, it's him. Look at what he says. He says, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. An individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. So I've got to call attention to it. He says, I want you to be subject as long as those laws are in alignment with God's law. This last two, let's just run through these quickly. What does it mean to be a good citizen? Peter wants us to know our Christian witness is strengthened when we are good citizens. What does it mean to be a citizen, a good citizen? Number one, it means that I'm subject. But if I were to stop the message right here, I would make being a good citizen a very passive thing. So just do what you're told. Don't get arrested. Stay out of the cop's car. In fact, years ago, Chris Rock had this stand-up routine where he talks about people want to take credit for stuff they're supposed to do. Like you hear guys say, I pay my child support. You're supposed to pay your child support. But you want a cookie for that? You're supposed to provide for your kids. I ain't never been to jail. You ain't supposed to go to jail. <laughs> All right? So if we stopped it here, we could make being a good citizen a very passive thing. But Peter talks about what else it means to be a good citizen. He says, be subject, verse 13, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Here it is, verse 15, for this is the will of God that by doing good, doing good, doing good, doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Here's what he's saying here is a good Christian citizen does not get bent out of shape when their candidate doesn't get elected to office. Why? Because a good Christian citizen doesn't wait on government to do for them what they should already be doing. So it drives me nuts. Okay? If you're a Democrat, praise God. Praise God for that conviction. But don't wait for Democrats to care for our urban cities. Christians should be doing that. Churches should be doing that. So stop waiting on the White House to do what the church house is called to do. You do good. Okay? So this is the calling. In fact, Ron Sider, in his wonderful book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience, he says, do you realize that the average American Christian only gives 2.5% of their income to the Lord annually? He says, if American Christians would just tithe, would just tithe, there's enough money, not just in America, but in America churches, to cure global hunger for good. It's a doggone shame. All these churches getting into all this debt over all these buildings and all this other stuff while you got people coming to your church on welfare and you can't help them. To me, that disqualifies you from critiquing any president. Stop waiting on government to write grants for you. You do good. Do good. Do good. Do good. Finally, he says, I want you to live free. He says in verse 16, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Now, what does it mean to be free? What does that mean? I got two teenagers in my house, and they always say to me, I can't wait to get up out of here so I can be free. To which I respond, I can't wait for you to get up out of here too. <laughs> We're going to party together. The sooner you can get it, the better. And if I can work it out so where you can leave and I can still claim you on my taxes, that's better for me. Okay? 
So what I try to tell my kids, see, they have a distorted view of freedom. They think freedom is the ability to do whatever it is you want to do. Okay? So I tell them, imagine you're driving down El Camino Real. No stoplights, no stop signs, no speed limit, no lanes. Just drive wherever you want, left side, right side, as fast as you want, stop when you want, turn when you want, go where you... That ain't a picture of order. That's a picture of chaos. Where each man does what is right in his eyes. That's the problem with our country. It's chaos. I said, actually, what William Barclay says about freedom is really what freedom is about. Look at it with me on the screen. Christian freedom does not mean being free to do as we like. It means being free to do as we ought. Give it to you again. Christian freedom does not mean being free to do as we like. It means being free to do as we ought. So I tell my boys, you like this house? You like living in a house? You want to buy a house one day? Yeah. Well, then you can't spend money the way you want to spend money. You got to pay your bills. You got to actually pay them on time. You got to learn to tell yourself no. Well, why do you do something called credit? Okay? Likewise, to be a Christian means that when we got saved, whom the Son sets free is free indeed, but that freedom does not mean I get to do whatever I want. It means now that I've been emancipated, I joyfully submit to God and his institutions of authority in my life. However, what it means is I answer to a higher power and it's God so that when the election comes, I'm free. I shrug my shoulders and I say, I'm still going to follow God no matter who's in office. I'm free. So, dear Christian, stop looking so sad. God ain't running for election. Come November 9th, the day after, he's still going to be on his throne. Still high and lifted up. Don't mope. Don't pout. Don't be sad. God is in control. Let's close with this. Jesus Christ was the best citizen there ever was. He incarnated all three of these. He was subject to authority. They came to him one day and said, should we pay taxes to Caesar? He says, yes. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Show me a coin whose image is on it. They said Caesar's image. He says, because his image is on it, give it to him. But he says, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, but give to God that which is God, which means Caesar's image is on this coin, and because his image is on its coin, it belongs to him, give it to him. But guess what? God's image is on you. So you give God not just the coins, but you. Secondly, he did good. Jesus did not wait for government to green light him to feed people, to heal people, to clothe people. He did good. And that's why I love Cheryl Degree and I love Fred Degree here at this church. Cheryl Degree is leading up our justice and compassion ministries. As long as I'm pastor here, we are going to have programs that do good. Right now, already, we do jail ministry, we do prison ministry, we feed, we clothe, we tutor kids. We do good. Why? Because that's what it means to be Christian. And thirdly, Jesus was free. John 19, Pilate says these words to him. Look at it. Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Hear me. Hear me. May we crucify the spirit of chicken little as it relates to our attitude towards government, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton won't do anything without God's permission. Nothing happens in this country without God's approval. So stop with this sky is falling mentality. God is on 
his throne. Have joy. Cheer up. Vote. Be free. But God ain't up for election. He is king. And the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Donald's knee, Hillary's knee, and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord of Lords. Let's pray. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to be good citizens. I love abundant life. I love pastoring this church. Because in this church, it's multi-ethnic. There's so many different perspectives on politics. And I thank you that there are Republicans and Democrats and independents and there are those in this church who are going to vote for Hillary and those who are going to vote for Donald and those who are going to write in other candidates and those who aren't going to vote. But God, I pray that abundant life would live as peculiar people. That if our candidate doesn't win, that we are respectful in our conversation, respectful in what we write about them, respectful in how we talk about them, that we would honor in the name of Jesus. God, we bless you that there is no such thing as a ruler who rules without your divine decree or allowance. That's never happened in world history. And so we rest in your sovereignty today. You are on your throne. You're eternal. We're passing through. And as we are passing through, may we wow the world with our confident hope in who you are. And as we close, let us all stand together. I want to close a little differently today. As we get ready to leave this place, I want to bless you with this benediction. And I want to invite those of you who are maybe saying, I'd like to hear more about this. I, this Jesus is peculiar. I've got questions about Christianity. This door to my right is going to be open. We're going to leave it open today. There will be those back there who will wait to talk to you. If you've got prayer needs, elders are going to come forward. But I want us to say these words together words that are on the screen they provide a fitting benediction to this message let us say them together God in these uncertain political times we your people refuse to live in despair we are free because you have made us free our hope therefore is not in Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump but rests in you now in that freedom, may we joyfully submit to government. And as we leave, we recommit to our call as exiles to do good right here in the Bay and beyond. You are sent. God bless you.